he's going to introduce us, and then so we, maybe we'll sit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hello everyone and good evening and welcome to the Concord Museum, especially those of you who are new to us. I'm Lisa Krasner, I'm the Edward W. Kane Executive Director here at the museum. And I'll keep my introduction very brief just to welcome everyone and both our friends at Mass Audubon as well as our larger museum community. Thank you for joining us for this evening's forum, um, A Wing and a Prayer, The Race to Save Our Vanishing Birds, um, that we're hosting in partnership with Mass Audubon tonight. It's a privilege to continue to cultivate the museum's relationship with Mass Audubon through exhibits and forums and facilitate these important conversations around climate change and conservation that are central to our mission here at the museum as well. Thank you to our partners at Mass Audubon and to our speakers, Anders and Beverly Gyllenhaal, for bringing this meaningful forum to the Concord community. And we're just very grateful to be part of it. I'll now turn it over to Jeff Collins, the Senior Director of Conservation Science at Mass Audubon, and I hope you'll enjoy tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Thanks to Beverly and Anders for joining us here in Concord. Um, it's so nice to be back at the Concord Museum. Uh, I was here just three weeks ago to uh, join a presentation by Richard Premack and researchers from Boston University. Um, and you know, through that presentation and a series of presentations that the museum has done and continues to, to plan and collaborate with Mass Audubon and others on, it, it, the museum captures not only the cultural heritage of Mass of Concord, but the natural history of Concord and the intersection of those and the importance of that intersection. The work presented by Dr. Premack three weeks ago uh, reflected his and his lab's efforts to look for historic data sets of the arrival, first arrival of birds throughout North America. They wanted to go back as far as they could to see how those data have changed. So they've, you know, poured over data sets across the whole country and they said, that the records from Concord dating from Thoreau, then William Brewster, then Ludlow Griscom, and then Betsy, Betty Anderson and others uh, were the, is the longest data set that they've been able to identify anywhere in North America, perhaps in the world. So we have dating right here from Concord, the longest and most useful historic data set focused on birds and plant records anywhere in the country. So it's a great legacy that, that the Concord Museum uh, continues to support. <clears throat> Um, and of course, Concord has a connection to the founding of the Audubon movement. Mass Audubon was the, the first Audubon organization founded in 1896 by Harriet Hemingway and Minna Hall, cousins in Boston who recognized that the use of bird feathers for fashion was decimating bird populations in North America. Having learned about this, they rallied their friends to boycott the use of feathers for fashion and hats. And, brooches and pins and other things, and they began an international movement that quickly grew. Uh, they asked William Brewster, a prominent ornithologist at the time, to become the president of Mass Audubon. William Brewster owned land on Balls Hill Road here in Concord, now protected as our Brewster's Woods Wildlife Sanctuary, which you should all go check out sometime. So Concord has a fantastic connection with bird conservation. Um, and that, that recollection of William Brewster and what became his, uh, the publications collected by friends after his passing, October Farm and Concord River, collect his journals, his observations of, of the bird records and the bird movements that, that he saw here and what he learned from that over the years. And that is just a, an introduction to the, the book here that through their travels, Beverly and Anders have translated observation of birds and in interviews with uh, folks working on conservation of birds into this book that, that tells us about what's happening, what people are doing to uh, address the de decline of birds across the country, and, um, and things that we can also do. So I'm so excited to have them here today. <clears throat> um, to provide an introduction to Anderson Beverly, other than their, their names, and they'll talk about their history in the book, 
Anders and Beverly are veteran journalists who've worked for decades as reporters, editors, and photographers. Beverly was a feature writer, then food editor, and finally syndicated columnist and cookbook author. Her Desperation Dinners series has a quarter million copies in print. Anders was an investigative reporter at the Miami Herald, then went on to become the top editor in newsrooms in Raleigh, Minneapolis, Miami, and Washington. He's long been active in journalism circles, serving on the board of the Pulitzer Prizes, Society of Newspaper Editors and Journalism Funding Partners, a new startup that's supporting local news across the country. As their work slowed down, Beverly and Andrew started following birds and photographing and writing about them for magazines and newspapers around the country that led to this book, A Wing and a Prayer, The Race to Save Our Vanishing Birds, published this spring by Simon & Schuster and praised by reviewers from the New York Times to the Washington Post and available to my left <coughs> by my colleagues from the Audubon shop, Ruth and Leslie. Their presentation draws on 25,000 miles of travel across the hemisphere, researching the book, interviews with 300 people in every station in the world of birds, and scores of Anders' photos and birds featured in these pages. I'm really looking to the presentation um, and to the question and answer we'll have afterwards in time to uh, uh, get books and have signatures personalized by Anders and Beverly. And I'd just like our staff to raise their hands. Wayne Peterson, director of our Important Bird Areas program, John Herbert, our Director of Bird Conservation, Jeff Ritterson, Field Ornithologist, and Amanda Lagoy, uh, our Conservation Programs Manager. Um, so thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you, Anderson Beverly. Oh, thank Take you. it from me. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, Jeff, thank you, and thanks to everybody for being here. We're um, we're really excited because um, Mass Audubon is where it all happens, right? You guys have got the, you know, it's like hallowed ground we're standing on or something. So we really, really appreciate you all coming out and letting us talk to you tonight. Yeah, so we're going to take you on a tour of not all those 25,000 miles, but the best parts of them. And then, um, then we'll get to questions because that's always really the most interesting uh, part of these discussions, your questions and our, our conversation that will follow. We're going to start uh, by reading um, the first five chapters of the book. <laughs> no, um, just the, uh, a little bit uh, from, from the introduction. The title is, What the Birds Are Telling Us. There he is, someone shouts. And sure enough, the tiny, sharp beak of Florida grasshopper sparrow number 2050176 oh, pokes out from behind a clump of wire grass. Ever so slowly, the bird steps forward until he reaches the ledge of the giant mobile cage where he spent the past day getting ready for the mission ahead. Hatched in captivity and raised for this very moment, the bird woke up to something he's never seen before. The enclosure's front metal gate is gone and an ocean of central Florida grassland is spread out before him. A handful of researchers watch crouched in the surrounding field, barely breathing as they wait to see if 20 years of research and experimentation will pay off. A full minute, then another tick by while the small brown bird, and here is the look at the guy, its spindly pink legs ringed with ID bands, just stands there. At last, the, bear, the sparrow makes his move. He half flies, half dives off the ledge into the wild in what everyone hopes <coughs> will be the first step in rebuilding the continent's most endangered bird. At the other end of the country, a foot and a half tall California spotted owl is planted on her nest on a jagged, broken branch in the most remote corner of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. This is rugged country filled with six varieties of towering pines and canyons carved out by a half dozen rivers punctuated by giant boulders left scattered by glaciers four million years ago. The closest roads, more like dirt paths, get almost no traffic. The only sounds many days are chattering jays and juncos and the wind whooshing by at 6,000 feet above sea level. And this is the owl. There aren't any people around, but the owl isn't exactly alone. Her every move is captured three different ways. When the owl launches into her loud bark-like call, the hoots are picked up by high-tech recorders strapped to nearby trees. When she shoots down to snag a flying squirrel, the hunt is captured by a motion-activated camera. 
When the owl leaves the nest to patrol her territory, a tiny transmitter attached to her tra tail feathers comes along. Every hoot, whistle, and call is tracked and analyzed in the world's largest project using sound to study wildlife. In a few months, when researchers collect what amounts to a million hours of recordings throughout, from throughout the entire range, they hope to know what it will take to save this owl. So this book is, is about this passionate cast of characters, including some folks in this room, you know, who are scientists and birders and ranchers and hunters and philanthropists who are out trying to save birds at what we all know is a really fragile time. Um, it, it, it's, there's, there's two forces at work at once, right? Um, one is this enormous pressure on birds that we're all familiar with and in and, and many cases working on. And the other are the technologies and innovations and, and ideas and conservation and a long list of really interesting research projects that many of which we'll, we'll touch on today. You know, scientists have developed ever smaller devices for tracking, you know, sort of the size of a hearing aid, tracking birds on, on their migration. There's a whole slew, and we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier, uh, of towers going up, the MODIS system, that's sort of like um, air traffic controllers for birds, tracking them through radio radio technology, wherever that they, they might go. Um, there's even a satellite that's attached to the International Space Station uh, that is able to follow birds and other wildlife you know, all around the globe a as they move. Um, and and you know, one group, uh, actually more than one group, is using uh, genomics, uh, f borrowing from the human genome development uh, to try to figure out how to bring the passenger pigeon back from extinction. Um, and there's a whole slew of things. That's just a sort of touching on a few of them. And that's why we call this a race. So which of these forces is going to prevail? And um, we talked with conservation leaders all over the country, and they told us that um, this race is probably going to be decided in about the next 10 years or so. And the CEO of National Audubon Society, Elizabeth Gray, said to us, we have about a decade to get this right. We have to make progress now, or we'll be past the point of no return. So our topic is birds, but really this is a slice, as we all know, of the broader environmental struggle that is the story of our time, right? I mean, this is, uh, and birds are a particularly good lens through which to watch and, and try to understand what's happening. So the first thing you need to know about us is that we are not scientists. We have a whole bunch of them in the room, and um, we are not them, and we're not bird experts. But what we are are journalists and mainly storytellers. And so what we hoped to do with this book was to get out and to find a way to take the, the breadth of everything that we learned and translate that into stories that, <clears throat> that everyone could relate to. And... Um, so we um, started to be birders about 10 years ago, and um, we became completely captivated by birds. We both grew up with bird feeders in our backyard, and we knew what blue jays were and what cardinals were, but there were so many birds that um, we would see that we didn't know what they were. And with every single new bird, we became captivated all over again by their beauty and also by their mechanics. <clears throat> And uh, then we sort of realized that there was another aspect of this too, is why should we care? How can we make people understand through the book of why maybe they should care? And as many of you in this room tonight know, um, birds are really nature's workhorses. They pollinate all manner of flowers and plants, and they consume 500 tons of insects every year. And those are insects that are not going to be biting you and destroying apple crops, et cetera, et cetera. They also fertilize the um, lands and the oceans, and they clean up nature's refuse, like this black vulture. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things we love is that new studies have shown, lots of new studies have shown, that birds are really good for your mental health. So go bird watching, and you'll be a healthier person. Um, for us, we started um, birding when we lived in a condo in downtown Washington, D.C. We were about seven blocks from the White House, 
And on the weekends, um, we would like to get out into nature. Um, and we actually would go camping because we would go to bluegrass festivals because Anders is a banjo player. And um, we'd be out at the campsite and we'd just start seeing these birds and we didn't know what they were. So Anders would take a picture and you'll see um, his photos are all um, the ones that we'll be seeing tonight. So he'd take the pictures by day, we chase the birds, and then at night we go back into the camper and we get out the bird guide and we go page by page and we go, oh, well, that one has pink feet, that can't, that can't be it. Uh, oh, well, this one has the orange bill underneath and the brown bill on top, it has to be that one. So that's basically how we learned. That was way before you could just now upload your photos, you know, to this wonderful app and it just spits out the ID. But we really kind of are grateful for that um, training now because it really, it really was helpful. Um, <clears throat> so being journalists, it wasn't long before we decided that we really needed a place to keep all those photos. And Anders had learned how to build websites in his career, so he started loading up all the photos onto this website. And in his career, he'd been uh, in charge of newsrooms of like a couple hundred reporters. And all of a sudden, he had one reporter, and that was me. And, um, and I was getting all these assignments to go, well, could you write about this or this week? I'm like, well, could you call that person? So we sort of turned ourselves into like um, little private uh, bird journalist for our website, which is called um, flyinglessons.us, what we're learning from the birds. And it doesn't have any ads on it. We don't sell anything, but we do um, sort of a monthly newsletter. If you'd like to go check out our site, you'll see a lot more of Andrew's pictures. And um, so all of that work eventually led us to write for um, newspapers and magazines about birds, and then um, that led to the book. Yeah. And an underlining you know, theme of the book is the relationship between people and birds. And um, one of the realizations that we could not avoid coming to is that Americans love birds, right? Americans love birds until they get in our way. And if we look at the history of birds, and we've even mentioned a little bit of that today, it's going up and down, whole species uh, wiped out at different times. And the point that we want to make is that in each of these instances, uh, we have stepped forward as a country and put into place either laws or policies that have responded. This goes back uh, to when the slaughter of birds like uh, herons and egrets and spoonbills uh, uh, led to the first laws prohibiting uh, protecting migrating birds. And then again in the 30s when the dust bowl uh, and drought uh, started wiping out uh, ducks and geese and groups like you know, uh, Ducks Unlimited formed and created a really powerful conservation empire that has since then brought uh, ducks and geese and game birds back. And then, of course, in the 60s and 70s, when we realized the DDT was destroying many birds, uh, uh, eagles, um, osprey, among them California condors, and we put into place uh, major legislation, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Endangered Species Act, and it really began the environmental movement that you know continues today. But this is, of course, um, happening uh, again uh, now, repeating itself. Because as you're all familiar with, in 2019, a group of scientists, they're all right across the way here at Cornell and other uh, groups, seven groups all together, figured out how to count birds for the first time. Before that, it was kind of a rough guess. We knew uh, birds were uh, doing well or not doing well, but there was never a number put on them. And by using weather radar sweeps and uh, the, the annual bird springtime bird counts and putting that all together with computations for the first time, figured out that one-third of the breeding bird in North America had been lost since the 1970s, a profound finding. And that turned into a specific number. And this was the chart that the lead scientist sent out, the ski slope of a drop of birds over that period of time translated into three billion birds uh, that, that had been lost. And um, that really raised a whole lot of questions, I think, in our minds. It answered some questions, but it raised you know, others. What, why exactly is this happening with these different groups? For the first time, you could see segments and how they were impacting different groups of birds. What's being done? And you know, what does this mean uh, for the balance of nature? 
And so we decided that the best way to um, figure this out was to get out on the front lines where the work was being done. So this was um, right in the middle of the pandemic, and it just so happened that we had a little 23-foot um, Airstream travel trailer, and we turned it into um, a mobile office and set out. I have to say that just in the, in the interest of uh, honesty, this looks a lot better than it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, we, a friend of ours took the picture, sort of a wide-angle lens, and, and we cleaned it all up. It's not quite like that, I'll be honest So if, if you don't count the bed, there's actually 50 square feet of living space. Um, people were really worried about our marriage <laughs> when we took off to do this. It's healthy. It's okay. It's going well. <laughs> yeah, we're doing great. Um, so anyway, we started out from our home. We live in Raleigh, North Carolina. We started out from there, and we went to um, Florida. And then we went from there um, down through Louisiana and Texas, out to um, Wyoming and California. Then we parked the Airstream for a while. We went out to uh, Hawaii and to um, all the way to Ecuador, and then went back, um, back home again. And um, we want to touch on a few of the stories that we found uh, tonight and give you a sense of um, the rescue uh, efforts that are underway and what the birds are up against and how fascinating and complex this work really is. So this is the Florida grasshopper sparrow we talked about in the very beginning. Um, and, and, and this bird had basically evaporated down to 44 last birds in the prairie lands uh, near Disney World. Um, and uh, so a group of, of scientists, uh, state agencies, federal agencies, universities got together and basically did an intervention where they uh, pulled some of these bir birds out from the wild and tried to breed them uh, in, in a several different laboratories. Uh, so we went uh, to where, where this was taking place this, uh, on the border of Georgia and uh, Florida, we drove all through the woods. It took a long time at a place called the White Oak Conservation Center. And all of a sudden, the clearing opens up to not birds, but giraffes and rhinos and um, <laughs> tigers and elephants. And we're like, we kind of knew that w this was going to be there, but it was still an amazing sight. And this is some of the work, some of the places that are involved in, in this work. And it happens to be owned by a billionaire. And that helps a lot when you are doing this kind of work to have the kind of funding that is needed. Way, way in the back were, were the uh, grasshopper sparrows being raised in, in captivity. It took, a couple, it took about five years to figure out how to, to do this, but eventually they created a, a whole generation of chicks and they took them out into the prairie. Here they bring them out in these little boxes and, and sent them out a little bit at a time and very gradually the grasshopper sparrows numbers are, are coming back. They've about doubled the wild population, and, and they have figured out a system that can be used in lots of different places. This is what happens when it gets to the very edge. It's very expensive. Each of these birds, and here's a, a very hard to see. They only appear, they, they hide down in the bottom of the grassland. They only appear in, in rare uh, spring mornings when, this, like this bird, is, get, gets on top of a, a stalk and sings for for a mate. Each of these birds uh, represents an investment of about $30,000. So that gives you a sense of how, how, this, um, how this goes. So I just love this little puff ball of a bird. This is the cerulean warbler. And um, we use the um, story of the, of the cerulean in the book to uh, represent what happens with our migrating birds. So this little bird is stretched all through the Appalachian Mountains. And then when it comes time for him to migrate, he flies all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Then he makes an overnight flight across the Gulf. And then he moves up through Colombia and all the way up through Ecuador. And so these birds are really difficult in lots of ways to conserve. We came to think of them almost like kids of divorced parents because we have custody of them for about half the year, but we don't necessarily know or have control over what happens to them when they get to Latin America. And sometimes those parents don't always work together and sometimes they don't agree. But what we began to realize as, um, as we began to study this and, and work on this particular bird and the migrating birds is about a third of them do migrate like this and they can go through as many as 12 different countries in Latin America during the course of the year. 
And, and that is sort of gets across the fact that, that in, in, in uh, all of Latin America, Central and South America, it's about three to almost four times the number of birds that, that are in North America. So if, if we're going to have an impact, we've, these two halves of the hemisphere have to work together. And part of that is just the breadth, the enormous breadth of, sorry. Whoa. Uh, the enormous breadth of birds that are out there. And here's just a few of the migrators, personitary, just an amazing bird. Uh, gross beaks. He's just got back from uh, across the Gulf, and he's just feeding himself for frenzy, uh, trying to feed up in, this in Texas. Hooded warblers. Um, and of course, the Rembrandt of, uh, of <laughs> the painted, painted bunting. And then, of course, in, in, in South America, you come across just a whole galaxy of different birds, the toucans, the toucanets, and uh, all kinds of tanagers. Um, uh, here's a tanager called a flower piercer and uh, uh, hummingbirds, the hummingbirds. And you, you know, look at that tail. That is some kind of a, an amazing thing. So these are the, the birds that we're trying to save. It shows you the breadth and, and, and wealth that is out there. Now this back to the California spotted owl. Is, is, and, and this is a really interesting project because it's using sound. Uh, and when you think about uh, birds in, in many of the most remote places in the world, it's very hard to figure out even where, where they are. But what did birds do? They sing. And so the development of using sound by recorders put out across, in this case, the Sierra Nevada range, 25 million acres the size of many states, uh, at, at, to try to figure out where, where these birds are. And then they process them after they've collected the recordings using artificial intelligence to zip through tons of data to the, using the algorithms developed by Facebook and Google, and they can figure out and pinpoint uh, wh where they are. So this is an example of the kind of technology that's out there. They have, you know, this is retelling the story of the northern spotted owl, which is a, basically a conservation catastrophe of the prior generation. This time around, the same things are happening with the, the, the cousin, the California spotted owl. But by using technology, they've been able to figure out where the birds are, pinpoint what needs to be done, and they're stabilizing that population across the Sierras. The largest and the most expensive conservation project uh, that, that in, in, in the, in the country right now is in Hawaii, which is, of course, the conservation, um, the, uh, the uh, capital of extinction uh, over the course of the last uh, century, 100 of the 140 native birds in, in Hawaii have disappeared because the, con the country has been overrun by all kinds of invasive species, mongoose and cows and, and, and pigs, and they are destroying the, the, uh, the environment and, of course, affecting birds. And, and so in this case, the, uh, the, the uh, mostly honey creepers uh, uh, from Hawaii are uh, being uh, decimated by an avian malaria that is spread by mosquitoes. Uh, uh, for a long time, it was kind of a standoff. The, the lowland birds had been wiped out, but the birds moved up into the high elevation and were able to survive there. Uh, mosquitoes like, need a certain amount of heat to, to breed, and so they, they remained in the lowlands. But as climate change has come, the, bird, the birds are being overwhelmed by the mosquitoes as they move up into the mountains, and now they're all threatened. For the last nine years in Hawaii, a group has been working to figure out how can we stop this? What can be done? And what they've come up with is they're breeding a, another kind of mosquito that is in, uh, produced in the lab and infused with a bacteria that when it breeds with wild mosquitoes acts as a kind of birth control. And later this year, they will start to release these birds all across the rainforest to try to to, to block the spread of malaria and, and save these birds. It sort of gives you the sense of the extremes that, that, are, that are now necessary to try to stop some of this. And it also gets us into the whole genetic. This is not a genetic solution, but it borders up on it. And that eventually is going to become a bigger and bigger part of what may be necessary to save birds. Well, the next bird, <clears throat> the red cockaded woodpecker, is um, sort of near and dear to my heart because uh, he hangs out a lot in North Carolina, which is where I was born and raised. And um, what happened was is that a few decades ago, this bird looked doomed. But it was saved by none other than the US military. 
So what happened is that is at the, as the country developed, um, bases around the country remained these islands of undeveloped land. And so the military basically it manages for more endangered, <clears throat> excuse me, birds, plants, and other types of wildlife, 500 species in all, than any other U.S. Um, entity does. And so basically what happened was um, as it became clear that the birds were on the military bases and they weren't doing well, you can imagine that the commanders at the bases were none too happy about having to play nursemaid to a bunch of endangered birds. So in the beginning, they basically were just continuing to run their tanks through the um, breeding grounds and troops were marching through the woodpecker habitat. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the entity and the government that manages for um, all of our endangered species, they came in and decided to have a little conference. So they're talking and the general said, well, I've never seen a red cockadoodled woodpecker, and I never want to see one do whatever it takes to get them out of here. So um, what ended up happening after a few more skirmishes like this was Fish and Wildlife came into Fort Bragg, the largest military base on the country, and shut down basic training altogether. Well, that got the general's attention, and they did an about face. Well, if you think about it, the military is really in the perfect position to save birds. They don't have any bureaucracy they have to deal with. They have all the money and resources that they need to hire the best scientists in the world. And they have a lot of motivation, which is to get these birds recovered so they can get back to the business of defending the country. Now, before you can understand how hard this was to do, you have to know that the red cockaded woodpecker is the pickiest bird that you would ever want to meet. For starters, it can only build its cavity in a longleaf pine that is between 80 and 100 years old, and the tree has to be dying but not yet dead. <laughs> And so what happens is, is that the, peck, the woodpecker comes and it peck, peck, pecks around the hole and the, step, and the sap starts flowing. So you may recall that the longleaf pine is what gave us all the pitch and tar and turpentine at the beginning of the country that was our naval stores and our ships and everything. Well, all of that was coming out of this woodpecker's tree. So he, he pecks, the sap starts running, he has to leave until the tree heals itself. That can take a year. So he comes back and he pecks some more and this goes and keeps going and for about 10 years. And then eventually the bird hits the heart of the tree, which is where the dying is happening, the dead wood at the heart of the tree, and it no longer produces sap. Well, what the military did, they hired these um, scientists who figured out how to basically build an artificial cavity that could be installed in the tree in one afternoon. <laughs> so before you know it, across 15 military bases in the country, there were all of these like little woodpecker houses going in like government housing for birds. <laughs> and what ended up happening was the US military has recovered this bird from endangered on the list down to threatened 25 years ahead of schedule. Yeah. We think the military deserves a <laughs> round of applause for that. And it just shows that when we want to do something as a country, we, we can, we can, we can make, make that happen. And it's really a profound story, yeah. So who's next? So it's mostly a great adventure. Oh, right. It was mostly a great adventure. <laughs> but not always. All right, so we were um, out in Louisiana in a snake infested swamp and we were uh, looking for the ivory billed woodpecker, um, an iconic bird that has not been reliably seen since 1944. And so um, we were, you know, 
coming up on the end of our careers and we had mostly been sitting behind desks and you know we were out there suddenly following behind all of these young scientists who were like tramping through the swamps and they were going up you know they didn't think anything about hiking up 10 miles up the mountainside and they were staring down wild boar and you know all of these black bears and things that we didn't even kind of want to think of think about and we were always always wearing the wrong kind of shoes. Sometimes footwear we didn't even know existed. So in the swamp of Louisiana, our guide was wearing leather chaps and he was carrying a machete. And we kind of had on our regular hiking boots. And the leader's here and then Anders is behind the leader and I'm kind of cowering behind him. And we're getting started and our guides turned around and he said, you know, it's usually the third person in line who gets bit. So I'm <laughs> immediately like shoving in front of him. But yeah. things really got hairy when we got to Hawaii. Yeah, and so in Hawaii, um, uh, one of the things we did was uh, we went up into uh, the rainforest to, uh, to work with the scientists uh, where the, the, the um, seabirds are, are um, breeding way, way up in, in, in the mountains. And um, we got there at his office, uh, this scientist named Andre Rain, a really wonderful guy, and he said, do you have your spiked heels with you? I, had, I said, I, I don't. I didn't know we were going to need them. He says, well, we can find some around here somewhere. And he looked around the, this office and didn't find any. And uh, he said, well, we'll be, we'll be all right. So we, we head up, and Beverly skipped this one, thankfully. Uh, we, we headed up into, into the rainforest along this path that went right along this cliff that dropped 3,000 feet down to the Pacific Ocean, glistening in a beautiful sunny day. Uh, and it was really a, really a nice uh, experience for the first half. And then it began to rain, which happens in Hawaii on a regular basis. And all of a sudden, that, that muddy path became a mudslide. And I'm slipping in my boots and, and holding on to branches. And, and Andre turned around at one point, not unlike the experience in Louisiana. He said, now, if you're going to fall, fall to the right, because if you fall to the left, it's all over. I did not fall, and we managed to survive that. But it kind of drives home you know, the kind of risks and, and what these folks have to put up with. Some of you uh, have this experience in these remote places that are inhospitable and, and to, to try to do this work. Um, so that was a couple of the experiences that, that, that we, we had there. The second half of the, the book, we look at the broader issues you know, surrounding the future of, of birds in, in North America. What's going to help not just individual species, as we've been talking about, but sort of the wider expanse of birds. And there's good and bad news on, on this front. We devote a, a whole chapter to a growing re realization on the part of farmers and ranchers that uh, it's very possible to coexist with birds. This was a story... Uh, we, we tell out of Kansas where uh, a ranching uh, family has figured out that if they make room for birds and are able to coexist with birds, it makes for a healthier ranch. And there's a whole movement that's underway and um, includes um, Audubon's bird-friendly beef operation where uh, ranches and farms will uh, uh, follow a whole series of of standards that make it possible for birds to thrive, and you buy their produce at a premium, and that helps to bring the marketplace into that. The same group of scientists who found out the third of the birds have been uh, lost got together to put a new emphasis on research and recognize that a lot of the government research that, uh, that happened in the prior century has, has atrophied. And, and so they're trying to raise $50 million to put, and this is John um, Fitzpatrick, the emeritus director at, at Cornell, is a part of that effort, to try to restore, uh, here's all of these huge advancements, but we need money in order to be able to make full use of that. And of course, there's also the ducks and geese. And we have in front of us, since the 1930s, a model for how to protect a whole groups of species, in this case, uh, putting a, a tax on ammunition and bows and arrows and guns that has provided $17 billion that can be spent on research and uh, uh, migratory and breeding grounds and has helped ducks and geese 
that, uh, that whole segment is up 56% during the time which so many other birds have uh, been in you know, these sharp declines. So it's possible to, you know, to change the course of events, even with all the forces that are, that are, that are against birds. And that's sort of, you know, that's the good, that's the good news, and um, there's still a lot that needs to be done, as, as we all know. Um, so the book goes into um, a lot of the things that, that we all do know um, are on the list of the, of the biggest threats to birds, like habitat loss and followed by the ambivalence that the country has always had about funding conservation management. And there's still economic struggles between um, devoting resources uh, to birds and to conservation and in taking from the resources um, for, for profit. Um, in the end, our state and our federal uh, agencies really are in a position where they can't keep up. We have allowed the Endangered Species Act, which actually turns 50 in December, to become utterly overwhelmed with the needs of the birds that are stacking up. Um, it can take years and sometimes decades for candidates to the act to even um, get a hearing on whether or not they um, will get um, protection or not. So um, what it boils down to is that our system of laws um, was really built for another time. And a lot of people would argue that now is a good time, perhaps, to, um, to take a look at, re at reform. And the irony uh, is that you know, Americans wholeheartedly support conservation for wildlife. Uh, you know, the 50 million plus bird watchers, people who consider themselves bird watchers, uh, 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 are you know, a, a, a huge force that could, could help push for the things that need to be done. The challenge is you know, how do you translate that into the kind of public pressure that will bring about the protections that are needed and, and some of the spending that needs to be done. So that takes us back to kind of the point we made in the, in the very beginning is that uh, you know, every time birds have gotten into trouble, and we certainly are there today, and, but we have tools this time to make a huge difference that, that didn't exist a, a few years ago. So that we're, we're back at that point where uh, there, there needs to be uh, uh, the kind of reaction we've had uh, in the past. And it's really important, we want you to know, that we came away from all of this uh, research and talking with about 300 people in the world of birds. We came away mostly hopeful about the prospect of using the um, technology and all of this new knowledge um, to save birds. There are some big threats that we haven't gone into tonight that I'm sure you all probably are aware of, like um, collisions with tall glass buildings, feral cats and pesticides, um, and the continued loss of habitat. But there are things that each one of us can do. We end the book with um, an afterword that lists dozens of things that any one of us can do in our own backyards, in our own communities, to help with the situation. Um, so we hope that you will take a look at that um, in the back of the book as well. And we yeah. want to get to your questions, so we don't want to... Yeah, and this. one thing to mention on that is that uh, along with the technologies that are, that are so helpful for research is that, uh, that have been translated into tools for birders, as you're all familiar with, um, eBird and Merlin Bird ID, particularly Sound ID. Everywhere we go, we're hearing just these w wonderful reactions and the power of these tools that can help you as a birder, but also then turn around and provide data that is helping to, to save birds. So there's a lot of things going on that are, are really powerful and very encouraging. So thanks very much for listening to our, 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 our tour of those 25,000 miles, not too far. Uh, what can we get into here? What questions do you have or thoughts that, that would make uh, new directions to go? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 here we go. Oh, the yeah. at home can hear. Yeah, good, good, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. How much do you think the uh, effect of global warming has put on um, the loss of the bird population? Yeah, and the answer uh, is, of course, global warming is a factor that is now playing out in, in uh, undermining the cycles of a lot of birds, um, raising water levels in coastal areas, so there's there's an impact and you're seeing it, and Audubon has actually been, uh, I think, uh, the, the strongest voice on, on need to this, uh, to confront this. The problem, I think, is that we're not really seeing the full impact of that yet. 
Um, it's, it's, it's unfolding, but it's going to uh, become a stronger uh, issue. Now, there's, there's some things that are possible to do that, that um, there's a really interesting project in California that's actually trying to raise the elevation uh, of, of, of wetlands where birds are breeding to see if they can make a difference for, for specific birds are moving some of the, the sparrows that are threatened in the East Coast out of those areas. But these are tough ways to try to deal with a force like climate. And so climate is a, is a factor and, and it's a, a part of what what's um, going to probably increasingly put pressure on birds. And I might turn that over to anyone in uh, Mass Audubon that has uh, experiences that might want to add something to that because we have a level of expertise on what's happening locally uh, that might be of interest. Sure. Uh, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, rising sea levels uh, right here in our backyard, if you're not familiar with a uh, salt marsh sparrow, and, uh, which lives in our tidal marshes, tidal salt, marsh, salt marshes, and this species has been in steady decline, and will, without immediate intervention and changes, it will be extinct within the next two decades. <clears throat> so, um, like I said, there's, there's efforts. We, Mass Audubon is restoring, managing this wetland habitat, the salt marsh habitat, to promote this, the, the ecosystem, to uh, rebuild the marsh so that the birds don't get flooded. So as sea level rises, these birds nest on the ground, so their, their nests flood. And as the, the sea rises and the floods, um, the tides are higher and higher each year, it gives the birds less chance to nest. So uh, this, this species is, in, is one of the, the peril uh, that I think we should all be aware of and, yeah. and push for its conservation. Right. Yeah, good, thank you. What else, yeah? How much, uh, how much of, a, of an impact uh, do, do the wind farms uh, that have gotten a certain amount of attention, sometimes it, yeah. it, it sounds like people are are throwing rocks at that, uh, but you know, obviously, it does have some impact. Is it sure. significant or? A sh yeah. Uh, well, yeah. It, it, it is not thought. You know, you've got col collisions with buildings that about a billion birds are thought to have killed. Cats, two point six billion. The number that they're associating with per year. That with with turbines at this point is maybe a million birds. So it's not the same scale as some of these other forces. And yet there's no co coherent policy that's been put in place. Not so much should turbines be used or not, but where do you place them? And can there be a, uh, a provision that recognizes that if you put them right in the middle of important migratory pathways, they're going to have a lot more impact? Um, you know, eagles uh, have additional protection uh, uh, from, from legislation. And so there's a, you know, a, a, an experiment in some places to try to track when eagles get near uh, the turbines to turn them off. It's a voluntary thing. Uh, so the, the problem, I think, is that this is going to be a booming area, more and more turbines. And we need them. So you kind of got a Sophie's Choice, as Beverly often says. This is really her topic. Why am I going on here with this? <laughs> but uh, what else to, to add on that? Well, just that, you know, I, it was funny because I, I got a call in North Carolina one day from our local Audubon folks saying, you know, call the legislature and tell them, you know, be sure and pass the wind farm stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but do we know where they're going to be placed? Because that's the thing, placement, especially down near the coast where the birds are starting to go over and they're really migrating. So we just need to be aware of balancing that in particular and putting some pressure on fish and wildlife to do the permitting properly for that. Yeah. Um, you talked about taxing hunting equipment and how that had been used to help ducks, I guess, mainly ducks right. and geese. Yeah. Is there another group of birds that people are thinking about that could be protected in some similar Well, sure, way? And, and this is, yeah, well, go ahead. Well, you know, <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> um, so, there's about four uh, roughly $4 billion worth of bird seed sold in this country every year. And in about um, 2005, there was a big effort to put a small tax on that. 
and there are 50 million bird watchers. Think about the numbers of bird feeders you see when you're just driving around. I know my mom would be thrilled to pay like, you know, a penny every time she bought a bag of bird, or bird seed to protect the birds so they would come back and she'd have something to watch. But it got killed by the, it got uh, shot down by the outdoor industry. Go figure. Because it was it included you know, the idea of binoculars, binoculars and uh, all the provisions that, that could be taxed. Um, right. So there have been efforts. It really came close to passage, but it didn't make it. So there have been things like that that have been talked about. Of course, anytime you use the T word, tax, it's very, very difficult to get something through. But, um, you know, there could be lots of birds that could, uh, could benefit. There's also something um, coming that's in Congress right now called Restoring America's Wildlife Act, RAWA. And it was passed by the House last year, but it didn't pass through the Senate. And uh, so the legislation is back in again. It's a once in a generation lifetime. It's bipartisan legislation that would provide um, more funding uh, for not only birds, but all wildlife and wildlife habitat than um, we probably would get a chance to see in a generation. So uh, when your Audubon folks call you and ask you to call your folks about, your um, representatives about that, please do. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Anything okay. else? Are these all dark photographs? Yes, they are, they are, with the exception of the ee That was one bird I couldn't get, so uh, I uh, had to, uh, uh, um, Oh, and uh, let me put up this too, which if you want to, if you want to, um, oh, there's a couple more birds. Yeah, whoops, forgot them. Uh, those were, the, that was the rest of the duck thing we were gonna, I should have used. But if you want to, um, here, here's our website and uh, a newsletter we send out every couple of weeks uh, on things and how to reach us and, 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 and to follow. And of course, um, yes? As you're traveling around, uh, how did you decide where to bird? Where to go and find a bird? So yeah. Bird, folks are traveling to, yeah. Got a Saturday morning. Sure. How do you get out? Well, the best place is one of Audubon's most important bird areas. You know, go find those, get them out. But um, eBird, we use eBird, um, which is a free app. How many people hear eBird? Um, okay, good. A lot of folks. But it's a free app that's put out by Cornell um, Lab of Ornithology. It's on your phone, and you fire it up. It knows exactly where you're located and it'll send you a list of um, all the birds that are around you. Or you can pick what's called a hot spot, and it'll tell you what birds somebody saw there this morning, yesterday. So what I like to do is I like to look for the other really good eBirders, and I look at their list, and I see where they're going. And if, um, you know, if I know who they are, so if I know I'm going to look at, say, Ricky's list, where did he go yesterday? And that's probably where I'm going to go when I get my chance. So that's one of the ways that I do it. And, of course, we all know um, where the National Wildlife Refuges are. Those are great places to bird. Um, we like birding um, in uh, the uh, – we go to Massachusetts in, uh, every year up around Stockbridge, and we like to bird in um, the Audubon Preserve Pleasant Valley. There, Pleasant Valley. So any place that um, has got the A on it for Audubon, that's always a great place to bird. And you know, the, and, and the Audubon website has a terrific um, countrywide list of places to bird, best birding places. You can't go wrong. We use that all the time. Was there one bird story in particular that was especially hard to witness firsthand? Um, you know, I, I, I think the whooping crane is a really interesting story in that uh, the the cranes, you know, have, this has been the lo one of the longest term struggles, uh, and, and has, uh, you know, got down to like 15 birds in, in the 40s, and now we're on a little under a thousand birds. So it, it's an example of uh, that you can restore birds, uh, but that's you know, that's a, almost a century of work to try to bring this bird back, and it takes so long and it's so hard. Um, uh, that that would be uh, on on the list, and we went out and spent time with with those birds. They're such beautiful, uh, magnificent creatures, but it's it's very hard to restore a bird when they get to that kind of trouble. Do you have a bird that you would add? 
I think that's a pretty good one. I mean, I think you really do have to hold on to the hope, you know, and the good things that are happening because otherwise it just would have been like, I think we would have gotten in the trailer and just laid down and never come back out again. You know, and that's what we talk, that's what we um, heard from a lot of the folks in the field is that you just have to keep looking to the bright to the bright side. And so when you're sitting there in uh, Florida on the dry prairie at six o'clock in the morning and you see that grasshopper sparrow, get up on that reed and just start belting it out. You go, yes, you go bird, <laughs> you do it. <laughs> and, um, and birds, you know, they're resilient. They really are. So if we will give them what they need, they'll come in your own backyard. Hope everybody's got some native plants going on. Well, thank you so much yeah. for, for this. It's been really wonderful to uh, have time to talk with you. Great. And is this working now? I turned this on. Great. So thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Anders, for joining us tonight. Thank you again to Lisa. Thank you to Allison for hosting us tonight. Um, I think for, for us at Mass Audubon, the biggest takeaway are the examples you shared of species and groups that have been in decline, but through concerted conservation action have, have been in recovery. And there's a story I've heard in the past of a curator, I think, at the New York Museum of Natural History, who thought that they were witnessing the disappearance of the buffalo. And in one of the American Museum uh, dioramas, buried a note in the, in the sand for the future curators. And he wrote, when you collect this, the, the buffalo are now gone. Because he thought he was witnessing the, the extinction of the buffalo. And through conservation action, we still have the buffalo. We're hearing great stories about their recovery. Bald eagle, peregrine falcon, ospreys, and others here in Massachusetts. So that salt marsh sparrow that John spoke about will be considered for Endangered Species Act listing in 2024. We're working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and others to do that work to protect their habitat, to support their, the resilience of their habitat in the case of climate change so that in 40 years we'll be looking back at that and say the salt marsh sparrow was there, but we, we took action. We Thank you both for calling attention to these issues in a popular way. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, please grab any one of the uh, a blue name tag to ask any other questions about work here in Massachusetts. Grab a book, have a conversation with Beverly and Anders. Thanks again.